put your seatbelts on because I want to be in full and open disclosure. I'm actually a friend with Gary, although we don't see each other very often. But for those who do not know this, I really come out of the tech sector. And I'm a nerd and a geek, and I just pretend to be a girl on TV. So that's where Gary knows me. Um, I used to run an ISP called PatriotNet, and I am a very strong proponent for free and open access to the internet. And being involved with somebody like Gary, who is an outspoken advocate for what's happening in the world of electronics and the internet, everything is happening in the world. He's an outspoken person for this. So I invite you to pay attention. So, how you been? I've been great. Well, you've also, didn't you also create the Texas Tech I, Council? The, the, um, I was awesome. the CEO of the North Texas Technology Council, so I really am a nerd, and then the Washington Bureau for um, Open Access. So, Washington okay. Bureau, so I, I tried to build a coalition of small internet service providers to provide open access as we were beginning to watch the legislation begin to shift and try to create two pro predominant players. So we used to go to the FCC and hang out with those guys and talk to people like you and say, hey, what should we be doing? So my two favorite subjects, tech and policy, you have covered. I know, I know. So I really, I love those things. I love them. I, you and I used to talk about them. Yes. Um, so, well, so how's business? Well, business for, you know, when you ask that, is it how's it for the tech industry since I have 2,000 companies? Or is it for, um, our association. Well, what you do? Yeah. Well, let's or talk about both. Or is it for my both. own personal financial? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> all. Oh. So personal financially, uh, we're building a house, and it's uh, out of control, and I'm a little uncomfortable about it. But well, we have to make it clear. Where's the house? Detroit or the Washington? The house is in Detroit. My my wife and I agreed to get married uh, ten years ago, but we didn't agree to give up our jobs. So we have. She works in Detroit, and I work here. And I uh, used to be we used to split where we would go, and now I go there because we have two young children. So he's got two children in the 20s, which when you read the book, you'll find out a lot about them and how that drove and influenced the book, Ninja Innovation. But also, his wife is a prominent ophthalmologist, or uh, retina surgeon. She mm -hmm. does retina surgery. So it was kind of like make the decision. You both kind of have, you're the head of the CEA, the largest consumer electronics association of its kind. And then she's a prominent and very successful surgeon. So it's like, you come here, we'll go there, you go here, and just said, okay, it's a truce, we're going to. Now I go there. Now you go there with the two kids. kids. Yeah. kids makes, makes a difference in life. What is it like having two small children at this point in your life? <laughs> um, it's, I'm tired. <laughs> it's, it is different. It, it's different than it, it makes you think. Uh, with the first set of kids, uh, it was more of a natural part of what you do in life. Um, the second kids was much more introspective. Is it first of all, is it fair to have kids? I'm 56 years old. Uh, is it fair to them when I won't be around for most of their life? Um, you treat them differently. You're, you will. You you're will. a little more mature about it. Uh, you, it's more precious time. Um, maybe you're better. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm better at it, but. It's definitely different. It's actually would help cause me to write the two <laughs> books I've written and, and get active on a whole range of public policy issues that go transcend technology, frankly. Is it, we're talking about what kind of future they're going to have, what we're going to give them. Um, and it's, I don't think it's, right now, I don't think our generation is doing a very good job of giving their kids a great future, frankly. I so. think that that is really an important issue. It's the legacy we leave, which is why I think you and I become so engaged in this kind of conversation. What's going to happen in the future? You know, with the budget and the debt and everything else, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, what future are we? I, I just feel like we've almost gone in and we've just raped a system for our benefit. This, this, our generation and what we're leaving behind is of concern. Well, I mean, the good news is that because of innovation and technology, there's tremendous advances and we're still at the beginning and things are happening great in healthcare, um, in, in transportation, and in obviously in information technology, in, um, in driverless cars and cloud computing and biometrics and so many things that are great and, and uh, in a ver some very clear paths to a great future, some unclear, it'll be serendipity and different things, but they'll improve lives in the future. The bad news is the things you talked about is financially, you can't lie about the numbers no matter how you look at it. Um, whatever the numbers are, uh, and it's not really subject to that much debate, if the interest rates go up just a few points, we'll be spending most of our revenue servicing our debt, and that's unconscionable. 
one thing I saw something funny. Somebody wrote, "Our children remember us forever because what we're leaving them <laughs> dead." And so I thought that's yeah, probably they're really, dead. really true. Yeah, they're one thing I was really fascinated in while I was reading the book Innovation, and innovation is a topic I am intrigued with. I don't know why it intrigues because I think it's where you take something we already know and you begin to reshape how you look at it. Would you agree with that kind of de description? You know, the the definition I have been giving mostly is is doing something different that people are willing to pay for. That's not a broad enough definition. That's a, that's a commercial definition. Because I was speaking for the uh, top people, the Customs and Border Patrol, and all of a sudden we're dealing with government and innovation. And government, it's not whether people are paying for it. They're just doing something that's better that has value. So there's, just doing something differently is not necessarily innovative. And that's, I think, important to remember. The, um, the reason that innovation is important in the context of the discussion we're having, and we just had about um, the deficit and debt, is we are in dire financial trouble as a country. It, it's just based on what we've promised ourselves that we can't deliver. So when you're going to have that financial problem, whether you're a country or a company or even a family, you have essentially three choices. You can raise revenue, you can increase your income, you could cut your spending, cut your expenses, or you could have a, a growth pattern. And growth comes from innovation. And that's why it, you know, we have to, we're the only association I'm aware of that has embraced the uh, simpson Bowles Commission saying we have to raise revenue and cut, and cut expenses. And that's important. But third, we say let's talk about growth. Growth really only comes from innovation, e economic growth. That's where jobs come from, that's where other things come from, and that's what's very important. So we talk about what is it we can do for innovation. Well, what does it take to be innovative? It takes a, a culture and an environment which encourages innovation. And by gosh, we have that in the United States. I mean, it is who we are. It's our immigrant nature, it's our can-do attitude, it's the fact that we value failure here as a learning experience. We're the only culture that I'm aware of. It's our heterogeneity. I mean, we are so different and different people compared to like uh, Japan where everyone is Japanese with the same religion, the same culture, the same background. I mean, they, everything there is consensus and there's not that many new ideas. And that's true if you compare us almost to anywhere else in the world. And we have our First Amendment. We have so many great things going for us in this country that I'm passionate about that we're doing it right. But then we're not doing some things right. And a lot of it comes down to you know, some of the policies like we're, we are kicking out the best and the brightest people now that we train. We have $7 billion every year going from the National Science Foundation to universities. And most of the work is really done by graduate students or foreign graduate students and cutting edge research, important research, and then we kick them out. I'm very and, disappointed you're not passionate about your topics that you talk about. <laughs> well, it's our future. It's important. So innovation is very, very important in so many different levels and so many different ways. And it's, um, but it's just not our science and technology and math and engineering. It's other things we do. So we're leading in the world in the internet. We have every major internet site is basically a U.S. company, whether it's eBay or Amazon or Twitter or Google or Facebook. Um, and chip companies like Qualcomm, companies like Apple, but biotechnology also, Hollywood, the music industry. Uh, we're, we're out, when it comes to creativity and innovation, that's why people like to say, oh my God, our schools are terrible because our kids are 22nd in some you know, measurement of rote learning. Our kids ask why. They're not, we're not good at rote learning. We're not good at factory work, which is repetitive over and over again stuff. We're too educated for that. We're too creative. So our strength and our future as a nation has to be in innovation. And that's Do what you think we need a revolution in education? Do you, are we behind in how we should be teaching this, this group of amazing children that are coming forward to be prepared to meet all of the innovative, creative things that we're developing in our culture today in our world? That's a great question. You know, when you're in the middle of a revolution, you don't really realize it because you wake up every morning and have your same cup of coffee and things seem the same. We are in the middle of a revolution in education. So you have the Khan Academy. How many of you are familiar with the Khan Academy? Love it. I so love that's, it. Uh, there's this guy Khan, a young guy who said, you know what, I have a better way of teaching to get some concepts across. And all of a sudden, he got some great grants by the, the Gates Foundation and others. And he's, they've, they've reached several million people around the world with these little snippets of courses in, in math and science and things like that. Those are for video learners that can learn on the internet. Uh, coming along is other forms of learning where you uh, have customized learning that responds to what your path is. Some people are audio learners, some people are visual learners. There's a lot of colleges now that are racing to get their, you know, their best lectures <laughs> online and there's tremendous things going on with that. So I think we're in the middle of a transition of learning. And, and what's happening honestly with teacher unions, you know, you have the American Federation of Teachers which is clearly you know, stuck in the past, blaming everybody but the teachers and not holding responsible. And then the, the other teacher unions are a little more 
willing to change. I mean, we saw what happened in the, in the district with Michelle Ree, where she said, let's have competent teachers. I mean, teaching is the only profession. My dad was a sixth grade teacher, God bless him. Uh, but it's the only profession where you, it doesn't matter how you do, you get paid the same amount of money and you're guaranteed for life. And it, and it affects even the university level. I was talking with the, the president of a major university, um, and I said, what's your biggest problem? He said, our biggest problem is tenure and the age discrimination laws. Mm -hmm. He says, we have people who are 80 years old that make the most money and they learned their material 60 years ago. We cannot get rid of them to move them along. So there are, we have, we need a revolution in teaching and, and we do have to value teachers and pay many of them more, but not all of them more. Right, I think that's really good. So this begs me to ask you, in your role as running the CEA, I mean, you, you touch a lot of things. I mean, it isn't like you just go in and sit on high and say, I have time to write a book, and I want to hear what our members are doing. I mean, you really take an active, influential role in influencing how Congress needs to be looking at what's happening, making sure that they're not going to legislate in some stupid way, not that Congress ever does, but um, <laughs> that you are ensuring that your members understand what's happening, where they need to be involved. You take risk. You stand out and you're outspoken on issues which for a lot of CEOs could get them fired, which I admire you greatly for that. And could you, in your role, come back to your members and say, we need to step up to this need and, and I want to see or we need to join together and create a shift in what we can do resources for it bringing a shift in education? Well, education is one that's, that's difficult uh, because there's a lots of different views and there's so many different ways to approach it. We do have sele selective um, investments in education and I served on George Mason University's board and I'm pretty proud of that service because it taught me so much. I, but I have no, other than being a student for part of my life, no great expertise in education. But what, I, but what we do do, and I'm blessed to have a job in Washington where we have these technology companies that are supportive. And the reason they're supportive, by the way, is because they believe we're a U.S. organization, so our focus is the United States. Now, we do produce the largest event in the United States. It's the International CES every January in Las Vegas. That's an international event. We get over 35,000 people from outside the United States, in addition to 115,000 people inside the United States. So we're, our business is, if you will, is an international business, and we have events all around the world. But our focus in public policy is the United States, and our focus in who our members are. They must be U.S. companies or U.S. subsidiaries. Their concern almost unanimously, is the future health of the U.S. economy. And that drives a lot of what we do. So if it, if it touches the U.S. economy, whether it's the deficit or education or um, taxes or, or immigration, that's an important thing, and we get engaged. So we're supporting comprehensive immigration reform because we think it's important, for, first of all, for strategic immigration reform, getting the best and the brightest, but we also realize we have a problem, we have to deal with it. And I think, uh, although Congress is not very popular, I'm going to, you know, I'm optimistic now that something will happen because there is a, you know, members of Congress are good people generally, Republicans and Democrats, and I think that they want to solve this problem. And, you know, maybe the Republicans got burnt in the last election and they realize it's politically smart, but whatever it is, whatever it takes, they're trying to address it at this point, at least most seem to be. So I'm optimistic about that. My ability to do that, you know, I think you have to address your fears and take risks, and, and you have to say, what's the worst thing that'll ever happen? When I first got into my job, I went to the guy I theoretically reported to and said, I really don't understand this job. What is it I'm allowed to do and what is I'm not allowed to do? And he says, it's a great job. You can do anything you want until you're fired. Because <laughs> I was going to ask you, tell us what your job is. What, tell me what you, if somebody said what your job is, what would you tell me? If I was, we were sitting down catching up, i said, tell me really what you do. Well, my overall job is I, I run an organization of 150 employees which represents the interests of the you know, $200 billion consumer technology industry and with over 2,000 companies. That's my job. I, in terms of what it is I do, I'm trying my hardest to make sure we have a future healthy economy, uh, which relies on a lot of things. Rely, you know, so social issues are important to all of us, and I'm sure we have different views, but it's politically incorrect for me to say this, but all this focus on social issues that we're having every day in our media, it reflects two things. One is that we're an incredibly diverse country. So that's, this is our weakness. So like other countries are mature, they have everyone the same religion, the same ethnic background. They kind of agree on everything. They don't have the debates we're having all the time over guns and abortion and gay marriage and all these other things that consume us. But the other thing in the scheme of things, debating social issues is a luxury because we are have a, you know, we're at the top of the heap economically. If we're at the bottom, if we're going down economically, which, which our present path is pushing us, 
then discussing social issues is, is not going to be our priority concern. If you don't have running water and electricity and infrastructure and things like that, you'll worry less about social issues. Uh, so that's why, to me, economic issues are so critically important. Social issues are important, again, to, to me also and to all of us. In fact, I've taken a, a, a very um, strong position in the Virginia governor's race against the Republican candidate because I have said publicly, and I have a Washington Post op-ed, the business community will not support him. Because as a business person, and I'm speaking as a business employer in Virginia with 150 employees, the business community wants to be able to hire the best and the brightest. We're having trouble getting and keeping our gay employees now because Virginia is considered hostile to gays. It's considered anti-immigration. This is it's considered anti-woman. This is not good for Virginia employers. And frankly, it's not good for the Republican Party of Virginia. And I've had enough, once I've said this publicly, I've had enough Republicans at least telling me to my face that they agree with me, that at least maybe there's some change there that's possible. So I'm happy to speak out on those issues. And, I'm, I'm, and uh, I, I haven't had, you know, with all this speaking out, we have 2,000 companies that are members. I'm not aware of losing anyone other than a sole practitioner, one. And, and one, a one-person business who was upset with our views on uh, car check union legislation. <coughs> we haven't lost anybody. And I, and, and I know a lot of our members are Democrats. They supported Ob President Obama. A lot of them are Republican. It, these aren't Republican or Democrat issues, although sometimes they fall that way. But it's a matter of creating a pro-business, pro-economy, pro-innovation, pro-jobs environment, which I'm passionate about. And that, you know, you can argue that for social issues. I argue that as an employer in Virginia. So you really represent both. You represent as an employer in Virginia. Right. You represent then your companies, too, because if America does not have a good, thriving economic base, the, trip, the tri trickle-down effect is huge. You know, I want to, and I was really interested in how you talked about India and China and France in your book and how you drew an analysis between you know what's happening in this country and I just moderated a panel on investing in Africa and the Caribbean and I was really surprised to learn to my shock that the next emerging economy which will take the place following China and all of the growth they've had is Africa and Africa is a fascinating it's a continent it's not one country it's disparate countries with different views and despots running the country, bankrupting and raping and pulling out all of the resources there. So I want to ask you if you agree with that, that that's what we should be looking at next. Well, you, there's no question that China is investing really, really heavily in the future of Africa. So that's one reason we should be looking at it, because to me, China is like, um, is the issue. And China we have a relationship with China which is incredibly, we're stuck together. No matter what we do, it's like a marriage forever. And we have to figure out how we deal with China, but, but they're also, they're out there to compete with us and they're not our friend. <laughs> it's a relationship. Um, so Africa is definitely very important. I can't even claim to be the beginning of an expert on it, but it is, it's important on, on so many levels. One, it's obviously the, you know, the poorest portion of the world. It, it, it's worthy of our focus as people for humanitarian reasons, but it's also <laughs> worthy of, of investing for a business. Now, some would say, you know, the concern throughout my career, look, was Japan's going to kill us, then it was Mexico is going to take all our jobs, and it was Korea took the jobs from Japan, then it was China. The truth is, I go to China a lot, and China's lose. I mean, they're starting to pay people enough, and you combine that with the um, one child per family, which is constantly, they have a shortage of workers in China. It sounds crazy, but it's, so people now are going to Vietnam, Cambodia, they're going to Malaysia, they're going to Singapore, and then eventually they're going to go to Africa. And, you know, there's a lot of debate, you could argue either side, whether that's good or bad. The people who are in the countries think it's really good because they want the jobs and the income and the money. You know, it's bad depending on the conditions of employment, and there's other arguments about it. Um, and there's some people who believe everything should be made in the U.S. I think that's beyond naive, we wouldn't be texting our tweets right now if we yeah. took that approach and no one could afford an iPad or a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I mean, Africa is a, is a great location, but, but China is the one I'm focused on. I mean, China has 160,000 students in the United States today, increasingly younger students. And what does it come down to? Why? First, they, they obviously want the education at the university level. But the, the senior people in government are starting to send their kids here in the elementary school, they're sending them to private school, because they know they don't know how to innovate, and they know that we do. And that, let me tell you, China has a 10-year plan. In it, they have a specific number for the number of patents per 10,000 Chinese citizens. That's their goal. They, they are so focused, and every time I go to China, all I want to know how they could innovate more, what they could do, what are they doing wrong. And it's, 
well, you know, first of all, open up your internet so people can see what's going on in the world. Let Google in. Let, let all these other things in that are not, they're just not doing. Um, but they're frustrated because they're known as the copying society, and to a large extent they are. It's really interesting, and I thought what was really compelling about China, and, and I learned this during the conversation. Carlisle was one of the companies that was on the panel I was moderating, and he said that the difference between when an American company goes in, we bring our ideas, our innovation, our solutions, and we share that with the community where we land. We don't just send trucks and not bolts to fix it and training how to fix the truck. I mean, if you don't put those things together, you can't really bring innovation and new ideas. China goes in and they bring their own people, they share it, they take what they want and they leave. So nothing, so they don't bring to shift an environment or culture. They just come in and say, we're here for us, we're going to do for us, we're going to use our people, our resources, and we're going to take that back. Would you agree that that's the way we behave? Um, the laws in China are so strict that you do not have a choice, to be honest. You can't own, you have to own a, have a minority interest to do business in China, essentially. Uh, they're very, very strict, and it's, it's, it, there's a lot of permits and rules you have to follow, and you have to be very careful in going in there to do it their way, and you have to agree to share. Now, having said that, I think some of our best companies only give their second best technology to China. You're not going to see cutting edge manufacturing in China because our companies are not dumb. They're not going to, because the Chinese will take it. And every, everyone who has a Chinese factory, and it's a lot of the people I deal with, you know, they know there's a back door of the factory that's stealing their product. There's intellectual property. There's trademark theft. I mean, it, it's a tough country to do business. But, it, but they're, they're um, upper class. Uh, their number of millionaires, uh, I think at this point, already exceeds our number of millionaires. We think we're a wealthy country in terms of the, but it's just a numbers game. If 10% or 5% of the population are wealthy, that's 5% of 1.4 billion people. Is, um, that's, that's like a lot of people. <laughs> it's over 10 million millionaires. 